So in that case, your uh, line of code in your uh, console will be just one line, which is the execute for the um, uh, inspect break. I did a video on debugging in WebDriver IO using the VS Code debugging. So if you're interested, I post that in chat. Oh, oh great. Cool. Thank you. Anything for WebDriver IO? I mean, sorry, for WebStorm? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's definitely for WebDriver IO. No, not for WebStorm. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. So um, I started recording the session uh, just in case we, uh, we want to upload this to YouTube or not. Um, uh, but recording, I think, makes sense. Um, so I don't have much of an agenda. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, for the second contributor meeting, I think we had one last year some, at some time in the summer. I'm not sure um, with a couple of other people. But uh, now I thought during the call-up summit, it would be a great time to just you know, meet and uh, have a chat about uh, web Um And I would say before we start, let's, let's do a round of introduction. Um, because I'm not sure if everyone knows the other person um, and tell who you are and where you contributed. Um, I will start. Um, I'm Christian, working at Sauce Labs um, and um, started contributing a while ago to WebRL um, and had my fingers almost everywhere, um, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I, I give it up to Xu. Oh yeah. Uh, so my name is Zhu. Um, working in uh, in in the Bay Area, U.S. Uh, now, right now, I'm working in at the uh, biotech company. Uh, so um, got exposed to WebDriver I/O back in 2014. Uh, then um, make a little bit contribution, right, Christian? Not not too much. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I would say I have a lot of uh, like feedback because I'm a kind of like a field engineer. So I work in uh, the real like testing. So I, I have, I had a lot of feedback, uh, you know, how, um, how web driver is being used. Um, so I, you know, I've been giving that's, I think that's the main part I've been giving back to, to the, 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 the team that, you know, how should we like certain features? You know, um, it's most often, uh, most often used in the field, rather than um, you just you know, for the sake of a new feature, like theoretic theoretically is you know it's useful. You, that's in, just in your imagination, uh, rather than you know, you're you're, you're working on a real problem. Um, that's why you get the, the um, that's where you get the first uh, first hand uh, experience. I think that that's it. <laughs> Just pass it to someone else. Uh, maybe uh, Arvin. Yeah, sure. Hi guys, I'm Arvin. I'm from the Netherlands. I work for a tech company called The Testers. Um, I've been working with WebDriver Rail for about, I'd say five years now, and uh, part of the uh, steering committee, um, worked my way up from like, I think it's been around three years now since I've been contributing actively. So, yeah. And I'll pass it on to Wim. Okay, well, I'm Wim, Wim Sellers, live in the Netherlands, work at SaaS Labs, uh, colleague of uh, Christian. Um, and contributed to or started using WebDriver I think three years ago for a native app, React Native app uh, project. Started helping out with uh, answering questions on Gitter, did some pull requests, uh, and created my own plugins for WebDriver IO and got a lot of support from all you guys. So thanks for that. Okay, Walter. Hi, my name is Wouter. Uh, I'm also living in the Netherlands, so uh, hi. <laughs> uh, I worked at a big web agency in the Netherlands and uh, used um, Cucumber over there and then integrated it with WebDriver.io. So I contributed a lot to the uh, Cucumber boilerplate project. And nowadays I work at a tech company that's uh, called Sortemine, working for Dutch healthcare. Uh, and we uh, used Protector before, but we were 
not really happy about that. So we're now also switching to uh, testing Angular with WebDriver IO. So uh, next, uh, it's called clamping. Hey, I'm uh, Kevin, uh, but okay, my, okay. my screen name for some reason says clamping because I can't change it because it's Zoom. Um, uh, Kevin Lamping, I have been working with WebDriver IO for five years maybe. I originally got into it because I was interested in visual regression testing and there was a tool called WebDriver, I, or WebDriver CSS way back when. And then that got me into testing, just functional testing. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I really enjoyed it and wanted to, I've, I've been working a lot on the documentation side, creating, I created a course way back then, which needs an update. Um, created a, we're finishing a book on WebDriver IO right now. And I've done a lot of videos on it as well. So kind of less on the code commit side, more on the documentation side, um, but still really enjoy it. Um, let's go with um, Divi. Did I say that right? Divi, you're muted you. if you're speaking right now. Um, otherwise, Mikola, why we, can you go ahead? Yeah, hello. So, yeah, my name is Mikola. I started working with FabDriver IO, I guess, like two years ago, or maybe uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, I was looking for some framework that would simplify browser setup and uh, would allow to run tests in parallel, like really easy and it was was a good good match, especially after Java frameworks. <clears throat> I did contribute it to WebDriver, uh, lots of bug fixes mostly, I guess, and um, also developed expect WebDriver IO library. Uh, I'm also part of technical steering committee in WebDriver IO. Um, I'm originally from Ukraine, but currently in Spain and going to move to the Netherlands. So we have lots of people in the Netherlands now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, uh, well, I used to work as a quality assurance engineer or software, software developer in test, but for last couple of months, I'm working as a developer, not just developer in some consulting company. So yeah, that's pretty much for me. Um, guys, who want to be next? And maybe Olga? Sure, thanks, Erwin. Um, yeah, I'm Olga. I live in the Boston area in the US. Um, I work for a company called Intersystems. It's primarily, um, well, historically a database platform for HealthShare, but has, is now doing other things too. And um, I've been doing, I've only used WebDriver.io for about three years, but I've been doing testing and test automation since 2000 to date myself. And um, as far as contributions, I just recently have started answering a lot of questions on the Gitter channel, just because I realized it could be helpful there. And, you know, I've learned, learned a lot from there as well. And um, I guess I only have two code commits, one, um, one with with um, with Christian's help with the first ever web office hours inauguration session that for and then for some cucumber hook changes and another one actually with Erwin's help for with some documentation changes for TypeScript setup and I think I'm gonna do one more for um, for a minor change to the to the cucumber boilerplate projects Babel setup which is missing something and. Uh, that's it. Um, I how about uh, I don't know who hasn't gone yet. Um, I think the only one is Baruch. Uh, okay. Go for it, Barry. I think we cannot hear you if you're speaking.
All right, let's give them some time. You guys already can think about what we want to talk about. I have something that I want to go over. The initiatives that we currently on the way that are currently on the way, TypeScript support and the network primitives. And then you know we can talk about some features, ideas, what we want to implement in the future, and how we can make contributing easier moving forward. Um, and yeah, anything, anything else? There we go. You're muted still. Zoom sucks, really. Anyway, uh, my name is Barry or Baruch, whichever one you want. I uh, I work for a video game company here as a senior engineer. Um, I must admit that I've never used WebDriver IO professionally. <laughs> um, I have used other tools like Test Cafe and at SAS Labs when I worked there before. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, my first contribution, I guess my biggest contribution to WebDriver IO was um, the ability to select React elements um, with the, I guess, with the name and stuff like that, and filtering by props and states and whatnot. I've also done some changes to the CLI, um, most, mostly just um, to allow for the help tags to be individual to each command. Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much the introduction. Cool. Um, yeah, let's, uh, does anyone have something he wants to bring in? Um, what we can start talking about, otherwise we would go over the initiatives. Okay. Maybe the um, maybe the idea about uh, changing the driver setup. Maybe that's something to discuss. Uh, which driver setup? Like uh, the way that we handle uh, the current driver setup when we use Selenium standalone versus the, um, the 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 direct drivers, basically, uh, where we can use, for example, the uh, web driver manager or a own implementation and stuff like that. Um, uh, is there is there a specific ticket to that, or is this just an idea? No, it's just something that we discussed uh, one time. Um, is, is, is it something in our ro roadmap, like manage drivers automatically, or uh... there is a there is a project for it? Um, let me find it. Auto driver setup. Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, I was looking into the web driver manager um, by, that is currently maintained by the Google, uh, by the Angular team, or not really maintained. They haven't done anything there. And I wanted to make this a little bit more simpler using uh, a tool, an NPM package that automatically downloads binaries for you based on your system. And that would make the tool downloading a driver and start the driver super simple. Um, I wanted to reach out to that team, but I haven't done that yet uh, because I have no, I have other priorities right now. Um, uh, by the way, guys, do you think we need it at all? I mean that um, Chrome DevTools protocol is developing like rapidly and uh, can be a complete replacement for a uh, driver protocol. So we don't need to manage actually any drivers. Uh. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think the ultimate plan, and um, I've, I've participated in uh, the first um, web driver working group uh, meetings where we were talking about the new web driver protocol, uh, which will pretty much be similar to what Chrome DevTools is right now with a difference that you can opt into the DevTools. Uh, so you still create a web driver session as usual, but then it allows you to connect to a socket um, if, you, if you want to. Uh, so it can, be, it can be still a web driver session, but at the same time, a DevTools session. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure the fact that you need a driver will continue, uh, but you're right that the current DevTools protocol works really well in, in Edge, in Chromium, in Chrome, um, and will be soon be supported for Firefox Stable. It's currently only supported Firefox Nightly. Um, so the Firefox team is working on that as well to make this somehow compliant, uh, so Puppeteer can be run on Firefox. I guess that would be ultimately a nice 
nice thing, um, which makes you know me think that this is not the highest priority for me to get this right, to be honest. All right, cool. What, what do you think is uh, one of the most important things we need to work on? Well, it, of course, except of network primitives and uh, UI runner, which uh, everyone talks about. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, the, the UI part, uh, are you guys talking about the, the GUI uh, test runner? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. I, I, I really think we should go, go there like sooner. And uh, also I have a question. So I talk with the Cypress people. Sorry guys, I'm using Cypress. <laughs> no. no worries. Uh, but um, so, so th they told me they are using Chrome debugging protocol. I, I'm not sure if that's the same as the dev tools protocol. Is that somebody it's can confirm? The same? Yeah. yeah, so I think they, they told me they, they are also um, the challenge of, uh, like some, like for example, the upload uh, or something, some feature, the like browser feature is, is not, whenever it's not a native um, browser event, that's where um, it's hard for the, or it's challenging for them to implement um, that. So uh, I think probably the same thing applies apply to us as well. Yeah, I could see that they move ultimately to Chrome DevTools because right now they still have, they still trigger the automation with basic JavaScript on the application on the test. I think so. And they are moving away from that to be on Chrome DevTools only, uh, which allows them to use Firefox and Edge and some other of the other browsers. But they will never, they will, will never be able to automate Safari or other browsers or mobile browsers that will never be possible. Or, well, they say they put it on their roadmap, but I, I have doubts that this will happen anytime soon. Do you have any reference for that, for them using the DevTools protocol? Because last time when I said it, I couldn't find the reference that I got it from. Yeah. Um, I, I I assume this is kind of their uh, secret, like trade secret. So uh, I think official, officially, I haven't seen anywhere they mentioned that. And uh, they probably they probably don't want to admit they using pop puppeteer as well. Probably they, they it's just, not a secret that yeah, this is like a, we're working well. with our you know the the native browser Chrome Chromium protocol or something like yeah. But uh, I think in, in, in general, um, um, I would think um, the broader compatibility, I think it's less, it's a less value to any framework right now. I think it's just eventually, I think it will just like all the browser vendors gonna, you know, merge or like it be unified to under, I don't know, Chromium, uh, I mean, Chromium or, or anything, or a play, play, uh, Arvind, you mentioned right. the play, play, right? Yeah, play, right. Yeah, yeah. So I think instead of spending our energy engineering, you know, um, efforts working on make it web trial support all the vendors on the earth, I think there would be more value to, you know, adding more features, you know, make, let's say, for example, make the upload, make the download, the build-in, you know, that, the more you have built-in features out of the box working, that's why I might experience using separate. Is they have a lot of things just like working out of box. You, no re configuration required, you know. So it's, it's super beneficial for the user. So I think that that's the direction that I would go, if, you know. Yeah, it makes totally sense. Um, uh, definitely cross-browser testing becomes less important these days and uh, uh, that's why, you know, focusing on Chrome DevTools features and build them uh, in, like, build them into the core framework uh, makes sense, which is why, you know, I started this initiative to uh, have this network primitives, which I would like to go over uh, a bit. Uh, let's see. So right, before, you get, right before you get into that, I kind of want to second that. When the past <clears throat> two years, 
I've written a ton of tests for Chrome. I don't know how many, like I could count on my hands how many times I've run it in Firefox or IE. It, we just never get to that point where we're, we have a test um, case um, that we're like, okay, we've got all the test cases that we want written. Now let's check it in different browsers. Um, and the overhead of, of running your tests in multiple browsers and maintaining that is um, something that I've struggled in the past just because browsers sometimes support one thing and sometimes support something else for some reason. And um, so I've kind of shied away from um, doing multiple browser support because I find it's more valuable just to have more tests that run on a single browser than fewer tests that run on multiple browsers. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to throw my thoughts out there on that, but obviously anybody's free to dis disagree and come up with other reasons why, because I can see other reasons. Uh, well, yeah, I, I would agree that these days is more important. However, for, for example, I worked in a company uh, like uh, a year or a year and a half ago. Uh, they still uh, have uh, uh, requirements uh, to support IE 11. And it's uh, and it's super super important. Well, uh, I don't know uh, about uh, like difficulties in terms of that, but uh, I guess I spent like two percent of time to support IE eleven and Firefox, so it was not a problem for me at all. Just added some like hacks because we we had like three thousand tests, and all of them were working in Firefox, IE eleven, and Chrome. Oh, yeah. And I want to say, I don't want to drop support for browser. I think uh, for multiple browsers, I think that's a really big selling point right now when people are comparing WebDriver IO and Cypress or WebDriver IO and another tool that only does one browser or like Playwright, you can say, yeah, we do support multiple browsers. I think that's a big selling point. I just don't think that it's a um, super, like, it, I just don't think that it's something that I would personally want to focus on. I mean, just as a user, oh, sorry. No, no, you, you go first. Okay, um, thanks. Just as a user, I mean, I also, I work in a company where, yeah, we're expected to test on the browsers that we support. So, and I, and I found I do run into issues on less, you know, on IE 11 or on Firefox that are not necessarily seen across all browsers. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it would definitely, not just as a selling point, I think more robust support. And I'm not saying these are all WebDriver IO issues. They might be underlying WebDriver issues or driver issues, but um, yeah, I guess just a vote for, I think cross-browser attention is good. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And if you would also look at the, the people that are in this room now are pretty smart, know how to do coding, to do proper coding and to figure out workarounds. Uh, but I think the majority of the people that are using WebDriver uh, um, don't have the automation skills that people in this room have, uh, making it pretty harder for them to find a workaround. Um, so I think a little bit of focus on that part might still be very important. Um, to support them because it's you know, like you all said it's it's still something that companies want support on the only thing we might kind of like pro might be able to promote more is uh, uh, the thing that you also mentioned Kevin is like having more tests for example on on one browser and just maybe do one or two happier or, or error flows on the rest of the browsers uh, uh, instead of running the full set uh, I think if we can kind of like promote that message more, uh, it would remove a lot of uh, um, difficulties on IE 11 or maybe on older versions of Safari uh, to get everything working. That's an interesting idea. Um, that's one thing that I did in a set of tests was I had um, a tag in my test name and it would only, it would either skip the tests on when it had that tag in that browser or it would um, only run in that browser. And that was really helpful. There was something to do with browser execute with getting the um, form field input. And on email address, you can't do it in one in one um, 
browser, but you can do it in another. I think maybe Firefox doesn't allow you to get the values from a text input that has a type of email, but in Chrome you can, I mean, it could be reversed. But um, yeah, I, I had a something in a config file. That would be interesting to see formalized. I, I think that would be helpful personally. And um, I do appreciate y'all's feedback on the need for cross browser testing because obviously I'm just one in like one single type of user. But you know, if, if everybody else is finding this very essential, then yeah, let's do it. Yeah, and if I can add something to that, also the, the focusing on the test. So uh, enabling, disabling certain tests also really helps in that process. So not only for the specific browser, but also just running only one single spec or one single test. So before we, yeah, I want to get to both points. Uh, uh, ben, you said something like, um, we should better focus on the, the, on the non-developers that have not the best automation skills. Do you have any particular suggestions on that? Or where would you, where, where would you start there? Well, well I guess with uh, what was already mentioned is with UI configurator and with UI runner. Uh, I guess it should help people a lot. Um, I've, for example, I don't know about uh, if Cypress really has some UI configurator. I guess it, it's kind of limited, but for example, when I was developing some website in Vue.js, for example, they had really great configurator and it saved me like lots of lots of times uh, time uh, when I need to install some package uh, or and even um, bootstrapping project uh, or configuring it in whatever way I need. So it's, it's gonna be like something that really should help uh, users, I guess. For example, like just have some uh, UI um, layout where I can check that I want to run tests in Firefox, uh, in Chrome, or in Appium. And if it's Appium, then okay, again, bootstrap project so I can easily start my tests like straight away with desired configuration in whatever framework I need and, and so on and so on. I guess it's, it's going to be helpful. I think that will remove one part of the, the challenge that people have. Kind of like the configuration is the first part, but I think the second challenge that people have is kind of like just having the proper skills to, to, to write something in JavaScript, but also being able to, to figure out, I've got a page, it has several components. How can I kind of like, uh, uh, code this in a proper way so I can reuse a lot of my stuff, uh, doing a, a simple abstraction, that kind of stuff. And that, that, that's not only something for JavaScript, that's also something that we see at least with customers who are using Java or Python or Ruby. So it's, it's also the automation skills slash coding skills itself. Are you suggesting an IDE that, you know, where you can pick elements from the website, things like that would help? I don't think so, oh, to be honest. I have, I have some sort of an idea what we could do. I don't know if you can hear me. I, I think I discussed this with you before, Hans, um, Christian, that uh, it was essentially like you can have like a Chrome plugin that you can do like record and then you record some, like you select some sort of input and you do some sort of test against that and then just renders a code, a file which all the testing code. So essentially you don't have to code the test. You essentially just record on your screen the first iteration of the test, like test that you want to, whatever you want to test, and then just extract that into a file that you just upload. And then the user doesn't really need to know any coding, just to, uses the tool. But like, all tools that have tried this have failed, I think, right? Or, or I don't right? know if anyone has tried it, to be honest. Oh. Yeah, there, there's been <laughs> many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, as, yeah, I guess the original Example, my, people are probably familiar with is Selenium itself had the Selenium IDE, Selenium 1.0, which did that. And I mean, I think the general consensus, you know, not to say that it's a bad idea, but as a general consensus, that was that was not seen as a, a really good thing to encourage people to use because it really discouraged having a reusable modular framework. Well, just because the way it was implemented, it did it, it did sort of do a linear spaghetti code recording. Um, I mean, and there I, I, just, I know there are tools that try to do something um, more sophisticated with that. Uh, and there's one, I don't know if you guys are familiar, it's called, um, it's called, 
Excel, Excel Q or something, and um, and it does it tries to s sort of automate the process where you're selecting things, and but it creates this universe of pages and sort of reusable modules and um, like auto complete stuff, sort of sort of like Cucumber. It, it sort of mimics a um, a really modular, a pretty modular framework where you have page objects and on top of that, like business services. So, I mean, yeah, like you, like you probably have in mind since you mentioned Erwin, people have tried. So yeah, it's not a bad idea, but there are bad, I think there are n not constructive ways to implement it if it's done in a, in a very linear way. Um, I think so something to improve here uh, when uh, thinking about the setup and the reusability is we have a CLI tool where we can run uh, the install command, but our documentation never actually uses this example at all. So people often forget to add a reporter to the reporter list or a service to the service list, stuff like that. I think if we can update our documentation to include this example, this command everywhere, it would be a lot easier for them to just say, okay, I installed this and I don't need to worry about anything at all. It will be smooth, so to say. And also the, um, the import examples that we have, no, no new user is gonna know that this is a, a Babel example and, and they, will, they all struggle with getting started because yeah, it says uh, my import is not working, why? So <laughs> I've seen this question a lot come by. Uh, if we want to ease the, the transition for new users, I would certainly update to those two things and then I would start looking in other, th uh, other things that were just mentioned, to be honest. Yeah, this CLI install feature is definitely an easy first step that we can do. And um, I wonder if we could make it simple so that, you know, when you add a reporter, it figures out which options the reporter has. Maybe the reporter has questions that you want to get asked for, and it could in add that to it. The only challenge I see with that is, uh, which we haven't figured out yet, if, you know, usually it, it modifies the WDL config, but what if you have like a, a staging config or like a different name for that config? Um, then it makes it difficult to modify the code so that it, it only changes the reporter section. Um, I see what, that. What do you mean if you have a different name? Like if you, if you, you know, you have, if I have like a common WDIO config and then the config for, for running things on Sauce Labs versus one config for running things locally. Yeah. Um, so if I want to add a reporter for my local setup, then I need to somehow say, okay, this is my config file. And then the CLI tool needs to be more, sm more smarter on how it modifies this config file to properly you know, format the stuff and to probably inject the new service or reporter. We can just you can you ask can. a question like uh, to which uh, files do you want to add this maybe or uh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, or just specify file uh, we are currently modifying. I used to have multiple configuration as well, uh, especially mobile and web configs usually differs a lot. Well, at least in my experience. So yeah. Uh, the install command actually has a, a a flag called config that you can pass the the, the where your configuration file is, and then it will just over over write that one. That's great. So that already uh, exists. Yeah. That's for for the Selen you mean for Selenium standalone or? No, for the web driver oh. CLI. Can, can oh, okay. you imagine that if uh, we ourselves don't even know this command it works this way, that our well, users? Uh, I know it because I I added it. Right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, actually, on the sub oh, go ahead. yeah, pretty much the confusion that we had here is pretty much describing the, the fact that it's not documented well for mm -hmm. our users as well. No, that's true. I guess it would, it would be better to uh, build a UI configurator because yeah. and no one reads doc documents yeah. and <laughs> it's uh, not, not really obvious how to use uh, CLI. I, I mean, it's uh, currently uh, built like really good from my point of view, but, but it still uh, doesn't provide enough level of visualization of yeah. what I have now and what can I have. And yeah. uh, I, creating the UI configurator, it shouldn't be that hard. This is, you know, it's, trans it's a GUI for the CLI that we have now. So we, this is a matter of spinning something up, 
real quick is running the CLI in the background. Kevin built this already, right? You have something that was working really well for version four, right? Yeah. Um, you're talking about a UI that kind of managed the config file. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was tricky to kind of handle all the different use cases because, um, yeah, part of it was having to read the config file and turn that into a set of form fields that have the defined input. And while I could handle like my own case, well, what if somebody is running uh, their, what if they have their, their test need to run um, some commands? So, sorry, in like their package JSON, they have their test script. And a lot of times you'll have, uh, or I'll add something that like clears out some folders, um, maybe compiles TypeScript down, and then runs the WDIO command. Uh, having to to allow for that, having to allow for very um, um, config files that are a lot more dynamic than um, what the basic config file is. So. Um, yeah, I did have kind of a, a basic version working, um, and it was, it was nice. I, I liked using it because it was a little bit easier to, um, when I wanted to run certain spec files, instead of having to remember what the spec file was, I had a, a file explorer that I could click the spec file I wanted and run just that one. That was kind of nice. Um, yeah, on the subject of, um, I guess, the CLI or and or um, boilerplate projects and t modular reusable frameworks, I was one thing that kind of strikes me. It, oh, is that um, as far I haven't actually looked at all the boilerplate projects, but I'm not sure that they are really set up you using the page object. Um, pattern. I've, although I know we have documentation on page objects on the in the documentation, but um, I want I, I feel like it would be useful maybe to either have boilerplate projects that um, that have a more modular setup, or or to have the CLI that act a CLI that actually might create template files in a sort of modular in a way and I know that this I mean obviously we want to be flexible we're not trying to you know I think this is also like we were talking about the recorder we I think that's it's almost a different approach right are we are we for developers or are we for like non-developers and so far WebDriver IO is solidly for developer types which I think is a fine focus but even so yeah I mean I think I see a lot of questions on the Gitter channel about like how to set up, what's the best way to set up page objects, what's the best way to handle it, and it seems like that might be useful to have at least more documentation around, if not more. Um, Can't we just yeah. kind of like add that when you start WebDriver you're through the config, uh, we already installed the dependencies, but we don't add extra tests to it. Kind of like this is a test set. If you would run this command, it would run uh, uh, automatically on this website. And this is kind of like a page object structure mm -hmm. documented with inline documentation. If we have it already there, mm -hmm. then people can already they install the stuff and they have a few files in it that you run npm test and the project is running. They can see what's happening. Exactly. Got the Babel, they got the Babel config, and then we don't need a complete UI. It, it's nice to have a UI, but I think for people to to do the steps with all the installations and then doing the translation for how do I write my test cases with WebDriver.io. I think a few sample test cases with a proper page object pattern uh, would be really useful for them. Exactly. I, I totally agree with, with that. And we actually have in our company, somebody wrote a, um, like a template file generator. Um, so for, for specific, very specific to our framework, which is a sort of like a five layer framework is probably not, you know, not necessarily what we want to standardize, but it would, um, it would actually take a page. Uh, it, it would be specific to a page. You, I forget exactly what it did. Well, it, actually it was, it was like, it would also um, detect your, lo your, all the elements and their locator. So it was a little bit in a different direction, but that, so it would detect, it would create a locator mapping file and then it would create four other files in that same in that same pages hierarchy like 
we call them page objects and then we can business UI services and validation services if you want. And like, and we use Cucumber, so like a step, step definition file. So I, I don't know, I mean something, yeah, something like what you're saying, but probably simpler, just like a Google search example. Yeah. I think would be super useful. Yeah, I think going off with what Vim said, like um, maybe we have we can add like another command to the CLI, like init initializes like a default um, two or three file test that tests this web driver at your website, and then that way they can understand like how how to set up a, a, a project. We almost have that already as well, by the way. <laughs> cool. When you do a config minus uh, y, it will already do it like automated setup. So we only have to add this to it. Yeah, we, have, we in fact have uh, a project um, where this is documented, uh, the, the project number 10, um, which is called, uh, uh, blah, 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 where is it? Uh, Auto-generate sample files, which is essentially that way. And I had one kind of like, proposal, one ticket to define a proposal for this, uh, where a couple of people, including Barry, already chimed in, Mikola as well. Uh, so, you know, for anyone who feels interested in that, um, that's something we can build out. And I could see, you know, that should be, that should be actually straightforward and could provide a lot of value. Do you think that this would replace the, uh, the need for our boilerplates? I, to be honest, I, uh, I have to add that I completely agree with Ola that um, our, well, current situation with boiler boilerplates is uh, like, is not that good, let's say. Uh, I mean, we have a lot of boilerplates, but um, quality of the boilerplates are not, uh, well, well, they're, they're good, but some of them are not that good as we might want to and also some of them more look like an examples of uh, how to deal with particular issue and uh, are not really usable as a boilerplate. Uh, I used to review all of them like uh, a year ago or half a year ago or something and I guess only find, found a couple of them that can be more or less usable well in, in from for my goals but like m most of them were either like really really small ones that i can do with like in one minute by myself or huge ones that i need to understand what's going on here and, and so on but if we can have something like uh, something to bootstrap project with the proper structure we can agree on what structure we can have uh, and mm -hmm. I guess we would need uh, different structures depending on uh, framework or even uh, goal of what uh, mm -hmm. should be done. I mean, mobile, web, whatever. Uh, well, we, we can start at least with something. Uh, so yeah, it, it should be should be really helpful that I have just type at npm init uh, or whatever uh, dash yes and. Uh, then uh, install CLI and just initialize the project with uh, structure uh, with some tests that then I can just run npm run tests and here here we go my tests are already running and I have the entry point where I can start actually proceed adding tests or defining my page objects and so on so on so yeah this should be really helpful yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And also to the point of whether we sh it would replace the boilerplates. I mean, I think the boilerplates would still be really useful as well, because especially for people who aren't starting a new framework, but are, you might just want to look at a reference of how to adjust their own tests. That could be useful. Yeah, I think also it's a nice incentive for people to contribute something to the project without knowing the technical details of the framework. I saw a lot of people making like pull requests to the boiler code documentation and they were really excited to add their own their own boilerplate. And whether or not, you know, every boilerplate is really custom and um, every setup is custom and uh, I don't mind just add these to the section, but in terms of when we add this to the, to the CLI, it needs to be, we need to find a fine line between uh, useful and small versus too big and too, you know, too complex. Mm -hmm. 
All right, before we have 10 minutes to go, I, I wanted to just go over the network primitives um, thing that I have prepared and uh, almost, um, I think I'm almost 50% done with it. Um, so I wanted to make uh, network stubbing a little bit easier and wanted to move it away from um, the DevTools service and more to the core since Firefox and Chrome and Microsoft Edge will all allow this. And I'm in the lucky position to also implement this in Sauce Labs, so it would work locally as well as for people running their tests on Sauce. Um, and uh, I have a couple of things that I wanted to show. So the general idea is that the browser will get uh, a network property um, that is the browser.network. And then similar to how Jest works or how uh, NUC works, where you, provide an, where you provide a URL for the resource you want to mock, and you then get a mock object back. And this is, I, I figured this would be, would be the nicest thing because this mock object could have a nice, could be uh, typed uh, for TypeScript uh, so that you exactly know what you, what you can call on it. Um, and it's also nice to, it makes it easier for me to implement it on the cloud vendor because the, I wouldn't need to have to listen to the network events to make dynamic decisions, if that makes sense. However, like if you, the idea here is to, if you want to mock a resource, uh, using a blob uh, string, um, then you get a, a mock uh, object back on which you can then call uh, like a respond method where you respond um, a certain payload. It can be, um, in this case, it's, an, it's a JSON. So if you, if you want to mock a REST API, you can just say mock um, respond. Um, you could do the things that are really nice in Jest where you mock certain uh, returns of functions once or multiple times. Uh, so in here, we'll respond once uh, would return for the first call, injected to do, and for the second call, another injected to do. And then after that, it would return, I don't know what's the, how it would use after, how Jest works after that. Uh, yeah, you can actually set a response. I believe, and then uh, response once, twice, basically, and then yeah. after that it will do the default. That's the idea here, essentially. Um, that would be nice, and then you can also inject a function that would dynamically return something, which also works uh, already in this pull request. Uh, so here I just go all, over all uh, items that I got from the API and change the title uh, and the item uh, fr from it. Uh, so that the pretty much it allows you to dynamically change based on the content you get. Um, so a respond and the response once make a method that allows you to overwrite the response uh, with a JSON object or with an, with something else. Um, as well, another thing that I implemented was an abort uh, where you can say, okay, I want to have this response uh, to fail with something uh, which is pretty straightforward, um, and then which is really nice is that you can either clear or restore. The difference with clear is that you, that the mock still contains, like uh, as con continues to exist. So if the browser calls the same resource, it responds with the mock resource, but the calls that this resource uh, got, uh, which is captured by WebDriver.io um, is then cleared. And the reason why I wanted to have that is so you can do things like uh, expect mock to be called three times, let's say. So you can test, for instance, how many times the browser has called the specific resource uh, that you have mocked out. Um, and restore, similar to what uh, uh, expect does, is just uh, bring back the original resource um, and uh, remove the mock completely. What do you guys think of that? Uh, I think it looks really good. Something that I don't see is any um, any status codes. How would that work, for example? Uh, yes. Yeah, so there, you can. What do you mean with status code? In what context? Um, because you said you can abort, for example, uh, but you can also uh, respond. 
Yeah. So what if I want to have a uh, successful, no, uh, I want to have a 400, uh, but I also want to have something in the body stating, for example, an error message. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is indeed missing here. Um, let me write this down. Um, so um, that you can modify the header as well as the uh, status code from not only the payload, not only the body, but also the header and the status code. Yeah. And uh, something else uh, that I think would be very useful to combine, so to speak, because we're focusing on the mocking part here, uh, taking uh, Cypress as an example here. Uh, I'm not sure from the top of my head how Tescafe is doing this, but I know that with uh, Cypress, you can actually do a route. And depending on if you uh, modify the object, it will either spy or, um, or mock it. And if you just spy on it, you can actually wait on it, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, it's essentially what, uh, how this works as well. So if you just uh, define the mock like this, it will be only a spy. So you can still say, um, I want to wait on this specific mock uh, response. Uh, let me find the, uh, one second, if I go into wait commands, which is already where I already made a prayer for that. So actually, no, this is not the right example. I need to update this. Um, uh, yeah. it's, it's like here, you, if you start mocking a network request, um, then you can uh, wait for a response on that certain mock without having to set, uh, like without even need to stop it. Okay. Would it also be possible to just wait for a response without passing an object? Um, yeah. Okay, cool. I think this is just, you know, um, I wait for a response and I like, like with wait until and all the other wait function, it has a timeout and an interval, but you can also just say uh, mod dot wait for response without anything and it will take the default values. No, like in, in line 17, no? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say exactly. Yeah. All yeah. oh, right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, this is exactly what you mean. I think this this is going to be great. Yeah. Like for for websites that use APIs, not all websites use APIs, and that's its own struggle. But I would love to see something like this. I mean, you should. I I will. It should be possible to also respond with an A sixty four image if you want to mock images or JavaScript files. Um, the idea was that you can, uh, where is it? That you can be like, I don't know, uh, provide maybe a URL resource and say, you know, just redirect to that resource. See, I don't have that in here. That was one of the other things I wanted to have. Uh, so that you say respond and then you provide some, like a URL to a file. And if that exists, uh, uh, let's say file.js and if that file exists, it will respond with that certain file or it will redirect if it's like an HTTPS, uh, it can redirect to that resource. So that should be, should allow you to mock everything, you know, based on all, all other resources. So in Cypress, uh, go back to uh, Aaron laying, uh, so they have this uh, concept of uh, st stopping and uh, uh, spy, stop, spy, and fixture, I think. Um, so spy meaning um, you just observe the network traffic, but you're not, you, you're not doing anything, you're just watching. Uh, I don't see we have a method here like doing, doing that. Uh, so they're uh, stopping, I think it's the, in our case, it is mocking. Uh, so stopping meaning like you intercept the network traffic, the API call, and replace the, the real response with, the, um, with your own uh, mocking uh, return response. Uh, in separate, uh, I have used the fixture, so I just, you know, reading the JSON file in the fixture folder and response with that. Um, 
Well, that's so, your multiple too, right? If you define a mock, I mean, this is just the internal way how you define it, but if you define a mock, you automatically spy on it. And you can say, you can just listen how many calls have been made to it. Um, like how, many, how often the browser has called this report. And once you call, like once you call it, uh, like uh, once you call us respond or abort or something like that, uh, then you actually stop it, like here. Yeah, but uh, so they have the option of just like watching, like spying, not doing anything. Or, and also, if you want to do any something, then you do you 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 call in the stubbing to replace with the fixture. So uh, another point is like uh, so this only supports REST API. I'm assuming uh, does it support the oh. like WebSocket WebSocket call? Oh, WebSocket is interesting. Um, no, not this yet. Uh, but let me make a note for that. So I can create a ticket. Yeah, I think the Cypress is, um, I haven't seen, they have some example for WebSocket, but uh, I haven't like um, dig into WebSocket that. WebSocket doesn't do their strong field, so to speak. Yeah. But I'm not sure if uh, mocking socket connections is actually possible in Chrome, to be honest. That I, I think. Know. Uh, it's like you're uh, um, establishing some um, server, um, uh, like using the, because uh, the WebSocket call it just like upgrade, right? Upgrade of the HTTP, uh, uh, HTTP 1 to HTTP 1.2, something like, the, it's like upgrade, then you, you uh, basically establish uh, like a fake server, then uh, whatever the call to the WebSocket call, we, you will be routed to that server, I think, then they respond with whatever the, the one you want to feature or, or fake. Yeah, I mean, if that's possible, um, we should definitely consider implementing that, but so far, um, I, I doubt that this is really possible in any- Yeah, I think that it, yeah, this is a good for the first step, you know, I'm talking about problem in the future, maybe we want, Add support for the WebSocket call because, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of a use case for, for that. Um, so a couple of other things that are uh, also currently working on is just setting the user agent, which is um, helpful in some use cases. I actually, no, I actually closed this one because um, this is uh, changing or serving websites with different that uh, based on your user agent is. Uh, uh, not considered to be a good uh, way of doing things these days. Uh, so I remove that. If it comes up again that we want, that someone needs it, we can reiterate it should be something fairly straightforward to implement. Um, I wanted to implement uh, some network. Oh, I, was skip I skipped this as well uh, because it was kind of difficult to implement. Okay, sorry about that. So this will also not happen. At least not, I will not use, uh, focus on that. But the one that is already there is the throttling. Uh, so you can throttle on a specific type uh, that is predefined or on your custom, on your custom way, which is pretty straightforward. So yeah, those are the requests. I'm, I had struggled with the first pull request um, to get it working in CICD, but this has passed just a couple of hours ago. Uh, so I will make sure to update my other pull requests, and then I want to merge everything in this one thing and mer and ship this feature as a whole um, with, in one of the next versions. Um, and then we will see how how people will use that and if they like it or not. Christian, currently it's already possible with WebDriver to do the throttling, right? Uh, no. It's not? Just uh, for... I'm not sure if Chrome allows it, if Chrome has like a custom endpoint, but it's not part of the web protocol. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, that could be it. Like Sauce, I, I built a Sauce, a web lab extension in Sauce Labs to allow customers who run their tests in Sauce doing that stuff, uh, but it's not a Chrome, Chrome browser feature yet. Cool, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think we are on top of the hour. Um, I don't want to steal you guys too much time. Um, anyone else has something to bring up or talk about? 
Can we do this uh, sometime again, like in the future? <laughs> Make a regular like office hour. I know Cypress, uh, not Cypress actually. We doing the office hour, right? I would suggest <laughs> Cypress doing the same thing. But yeah, it's a super helpful, and uh, we can maybe set up like a regular, maybe a quarter quarterly meetup or something. Yeah, I would be totally down for that. Um, I could, I can see how, like, I can, I can make myself a note, and uh, we can then schedule something for the end of next quarter, and then you know check in um, if you guys are down to that. I'm absolutely, I will I'm definitely down for that. Yeah, that would be great. And yeah, if you haven't seen that yet, um, I'm offering now uh, web level, um open office hours. Uh, so I have blocked uh, four hours a week on Wednesday. If people want to work on certain issues and pull requests, if they need help implementing features, and uh, I had really, really successful sessions yesterday. One with uh, Olga and the other one with uh, Alexandra, who is working uh, for the browser company. Uh, she wanted, she was working on upgrading Spectrum to version six of WebDevOps, and we got it running within that session, which was really awesome. Um, so I've met one session next week, and if you guys want to, you know, do the same, um, I, I can add you to this calendar thing, uh, which I'm using, and um, you know, you can you can help some other people as well. But uh, yeah, I think I'm going to do this for the next couple of months now and see how successful that is. It's a fixed time, uh, I believe, now, right? Yeah, like, you can define uh, which hours you want to be available for someone. And then the person who books the appointment pretty much chooses um, between your options. All right. Then you can add me to that list. Yeah? Yep. Uh, then you just send me the hours that you want to be available. Um, and I can add it to the calendar. Uh, right. What is like every Thursday? What time? Currently, I have it. Um, on Wednesday, uh, 10 to 12 uh, a.m. Uh, European time. And um, I think, what was the other one? Uh, 9 to 11 a.m. Uh, San Francisco Pacific time. So, so if you want to work on a ticket, uh, then let me know and we can work together on this. You can add me to that office hour like for the San Francisco time. <laughs> I'll try. Awesome. Um, all right. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, uh, let's do this every quarter. And yeah, if you have, you know, let's continue talking on the Gitter chat and um, continue working with Doro. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.